Is just... duplicate me still there? I tried to eject it. Duplicate you is not here. Good, okay. Yeah. I, I just ejected myself. <laughs> For some reason, my... You won't know who I am and what I do and what my job is. All right. We'll go with this for now. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, January 24th, 2014. And we have a very special episode today. Uh, we are going to do an unboxing Lego build of the Mars Curiosity rover. So uh, before we kind of get on to everybody else who's joining us, uh, I got to introduce, um, uh, we got Ray Sanders, who has been organizing this for, for a couple of weeks with me, and, uh, and Ray is going to be uh, unboxing the LEGO Curiosity rover, and over the course of this hangout, right, you're going to be building it? That's the plan? Yeah, that's the plan, Fraser. All right, all right. And then we also have Stephen Pakbez, who is the designer of the LEGO kit, and so he's going to be talking about the kit as, as uh, Ray attempts to build it, and uh, hopefully Ray will get it finished before the end of the, uh, before the, end of the show. What do you think, Stephen? Do you think he's got a chance? Uh, he'll have to build fast if it's only an hour-long show. Yeah. Well, we, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if the show goes a little long, because as you can see, we have a crowd. So let's get to, let's get on with introducing uh, the people we've got here. So we've got Sandy Springman from Arecibo Observatory. We've got Casey Dreyer Hi. from the Planetary Society. <laughs> Hello. We've got David Dickinson. Hey, staying warm. Is a puny human sci-fi <laughs> writer. I couldn't put science; it wouldn't fit it all the way. So. Oh, I see. Yeah, it was a <laughs> scroll over. Yeah. We got Elizabeth Howell. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey. You're back from Mars. Oh, that's Indeed. hey, that's Alan's. That's Alan's thing. I know he's not here though, so I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to talk. We're going to get. We're going to talk to you about uh, what happened on Mars. So we'll uh, we'll get back to you in, in a second as well. We got Mike Simmons from Astronomers of the Borders. Mike, we you are sticking around. This is great. Oh, why not? I've got nothing else to do. No, this is this is great. I love this. Awesome. All right. We got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hi. And you? This is your second week too. You're. This is great, man. This yeah, is just, what a crowd. Doctor Nicole Gallucci, the noisy astronomer. What up, yo? And as I said, we've got our two special guests, Ray and Steven. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna go through that. So now we have got a ton of stories, and I. I am going to do my best to try and adhere to our hour-long-ish uh, format, but I am warning you, we have got quantum computers, water, uh, water discovered, pl water plumes on series. We've got uh, Elizabeth Mock, Mock Mars, uh, upcoming spacewalks, uh, opportunities, uh, 10th anniversary, uh, what's happening with NASA funding, uh, Rosetta waking up, woo! Uh, what's going on in the sky with the moon? We've got uh, Venus, this Jupiter rotation. We've got man, it keeps going on. Uh, Changi, and of course the uh, the new supernova discovered in M eighty two. Supernova. So we're gonna get into all of that. Uh, so first, before we gonna get onto the stories, we've got the special guest. So uh, let's let's get onto that. So. <clears throat> So, Stephen, can you please sort of tell us the story of how you got a chance to design a rover, a Curiosity rover, and turn it into Lego? It's awesome. Uh, well, uh, at the time, it was uh, early 2011, I was uh, working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In fact, I was working as a mechanical engineer on the actual Curiosity rover. And uh, I was, I was, I'm also a big fan of Lego. It's a big hobby for me. You can see the hundreds and hundreds of drawers of little Lego pieces behind me. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to make a little Lego model for myself just so I could uh, show my friends and family what the real Curiosity rover would look like when it was fully assembled, because at the time it was spread around across the entire laboratory. And I also wanted to have a rocker bogey suspension system mechanism to play with on my own, because uh, the guys at JPL don't exactly let uh, new engineers like me go out and take the real rover for joy rides or anything. So uh, in, a, in a single three-day weekend, I had most of it figured out. I showed my friends, family. They told me my uh, 
friends told me about the Kusa website where you can submit ideas for potential Lego models. And uh, if you get enough supporters, if you get 10,000 supporters, Lego will review your model. And if it passes the review, they'll turn it to an actual Lego set. So uh, with a, some, I uh, submitted my model with the idea that uh, I'd uh, add it just before the actual rover was launched from Earth, you know, to sort of the when it would be in the news so people would know what it was they were looking at when they saw it on the Kuso page. And uh, I got the 10,000 supporters uh, in another uh, uh, another uh, period of good luck timing when uh, it was, well, it was uh, almost, uh, it was a couple weeks after the rover landed when I got the 10,000 supporters, which uh, worked out very well time-wise. And uh, from there, it went through the review process, it passed, and uh, now people can get their own little uh, Curiosity rover to play with on their desktops and in their living rooms and see if their house could ever have supported microbial life in the distant <laughs> past. Right. If there, if there ever was, uh, yeah, environments that could have supported microbial life on their uh, on their in their apartment. I love it. Uh, so Ray, so, so can you like point your camera down? Can we see see what you're up to here? I'm actually, no, I'm not hung. Um, I'm actually on my uh, laptop because my desktop PC was um, acting goofy. So I'll try and tip the camera here. This could be a little bit of a roller coaster ride. I don't know. You seem frozen up to me. So, But, but oh. Stephen, you've actually got a, a copy of the rover in front of you as well, right? Uh, yes. Uh, would you like me to show it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the yeah. official... Lego Curiosity oh, cool. Rover Kit. There's there's no plutonium in that, is there? Well, I mean, there's plastic <laughs> plutonium in that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tiny little bit of plutonium. Yeah. Actually, uh, Stephen, weren't you the one who uh, posted that uh, picture of the uh, Back to the Future DeLorean kit with uh, Doc Brown and Marty running off with uh, RTG? Uh, yeah, I thought it was... Uh, pretty funny since uh, both vehicles run on plutonium and the dock has been known to run off with other people's plutonium before. <laughs> that is awesome. So have you got plans for another uh, something else you're going to build now? Rosetta oh, maybe? I'm always building things. I don't know if what I build I'll end up putting on Kuso or not. But uh, you know I every so often I'll do a new spacecraft and sometimes I'll go into other areas. Right now I'm working on some cool uh, steam engine type models. But, yeah. And, and what was the biggest challenge to, to sort of replicate in LEGO? In LEGO? Uh, I think well, one of the most difficult parts was uh, getting this uh, offset differential arm in the right position because if it's too far forward of the rover or too far back, the rover body will lean forward or backwards and it has to sit level when it's on a flat surface with all six wheels on the ground. And uh, the LEGO model uh, found a, a solution that, that's quite simple and elegant, and uh, I think it's actually an improvement on the design I had on my original submission. Oh, so they were able to take your original design and then come up with some ideas on, on how to, to make it work better. That's really cool. Yeah, it, the, the, the official kit is only slightly different from the one I submitted. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty much exactly the same. You, it'd be hard to see a difference if you compare them side by side. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, well, let's, well, let's move on to the news then. And uh, Ray is going to keep working. And uh, every now and then, we'll check in on him and see how, how things are coming. So... Um, all right, and you can and you can stick around, Stephen, if you want, and sort of uh, sure come back to the conversation. But we're going to move on to some of the news because, like I said, there's a there's just a mountain. And I know Casey, you've got a book pretty soon, so why don't we we'll start with your with your story here? Um, <clears throat> which do you want to start with first, the legislative blitz in D.C.? Yeah, well, actually, first let me say uh, the opportunity's tenth birthday. Uh, yeah, we yeah. just let's celebrate that. That's ten years of a rover on Mars, no pit stop, tune up, tweaking, or anything like that, which is pretty fantastic. I keep suggesting the hashtag Oppie birthday, but uh, it hasn't caught on. So. Uh, it's one of those things. We're just super excited about it. We had a show last night on uh, with Bill Nye and the head and Steve Squires, Jim Bell, a bunch of people from the rover team, just to really celebrate that. That was just really cool. So just big congratulations to NASA and JPL and all the engineers and scientists who's made Opportunity Run for ten years on the surface of Mars. That's a third of my entire life. Uh, like, uh, Oppie's older than Facebook. Yeah, and iPhones. <laughs> 
and uh, yeah, MySpace was the dominant social network when Opportunity landed on Mars. So that tells you how much has <laughs> has changed in things. So just wanted to give a shout out to those folks, um, and then also to kind of say why we need to keep doing this to make sure we keep exploring Mars and other parts of the uh, solar system. Uh, the Planetary Society, along with Explore Mars and Mars Society, is part of the Space Exploration Alliance. We're going to Washington, D.C. in February, uh, February 23rd through 25th. And it's open to everybody who wants to join us, register. We'll train you how to talk to Congress, and then we'll do a blitz. We'll, we'll visit 100 meetings in two days with staff members, Congress people, senators, everybody on the Hill to say, let's explore space. This is a big picture, space exploration, planetary robotics, astrophysics, humans to Mars, humans in space. Let's just show politicians that people love space exploration. So check out planetary.org slash SOS for more details about that. But uh, we're d the sign-up deadline is February 16th. Uh, but anyone is welcome to come. We'll, again, we'll train you how to talk to Congress. So that's a big thing coming up because in March, early March, they just announced the next budget request is coming out, and this whole sorry story, I'm sure, will repeat this coming year as we fight for more funding for space exploration. So everyone stay tuned for that. Yeah, last week you were, you know, you brought, you brought some good news, but I know that this can't last. <laughs> yeah, the good news, yeah, it was, NASA came out pretty well, but that's only because a lot of people spoke up for planetary exploration for NASA, and we saw the results of that. So the pressure, we just got to keep bringing that, or else NASA turns into whatever other people's decision wants to, to be. You, you don't want people other than you, if you, if you have an opinion about space exploration, you should make sure people know about it because someone else will decide for you and you may not like what they decide. So that's check out planetary.org slash SOS for details about that. All right. Now there is some some new, some bad news, right, which is that NASA set, has shut down their plutonium <laughs> program. Uh, yeah, so I'm always here. I make sure to always bring some bad news. So don't worry. Yeah. Um, the, uh, That's so really what quite... we've come to expect from you, Casey, and I would be really <laughs> sad that, that if you didn't have bad news for us. Yeah, so don't worry. I, I'm always finding something. The, uh, so let's, I want to be careful because there's, there's the plutonium program, which is generating plutonium, and that is still going ahead. That, that is good. We're solid on that. That's really important uh, to distinguish that. So what NASA did shut down was this new way to use plutonium in a more efficient manner. So they, they came up with this. Right now and for the last 50 years, NASA has used radioisotope thermoelectric generators Basically, the, the no moving parts, the decay of plutonium creates heat. They turn that heat into electricity. They use that electricity to power spacecraft like Curiosity, Cassini, Voyager. Uh, they were going to use something called the Advanced Sterling Radioisotope Generator, which was a piston that would shoot back and forth, generating an electric and then make an electric field, uh, creating electricity. And that was going to be four times more efficient, use a lot less plutonium, be lighter. The idea is you could use it on a lot more different missions than these big flagships. You can use it on smaller missions. So the Titan boat, which was proposed to land and float around in a lake in Titan, depended on one of these smaller ASRGs. Well, last uh, fall, NASA decided, well, sorry, we're out of money. We can't make ASRGs anymore. Let's not. So they, they pulled the two that were in flight production. They're shutting down the program. We just had a nice update from Space News, which I highlighted on our blog showing that 100 people have left the, the program in Denver at the Lockheed Space Systems. They're taking that hardware and they're kind of giving it to NASA Glenn to kind of keep the embers warm just in case the budget situation improves. But it's one of those things where we're losing this. As the ne this was to be the next generation of space power technology. That's gone. And that's kind of, it's a, it's a metaphor for what's happening at NASA now where the money's so tight we're we're barely able to maintain what we have, and creating the next generation of anything is becoming increasingly difficult. Yeah, and we keep saying that the that we're in the golden age of space exploration and astronomy, but in many cases we are still really coasting on the momentum of all of these wonderful missions that like, like Cassini and Opportunity and all these these missions that were done back ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years yeah. ago, right? I mean, Hubble Space Telescope was envisioned back in the eighties, right? Yes, yeah, Earlier. exactly. Yeah, nineteen yeah nineteen seventies they decided to make a space telescope. The uh, what we're seeing now, yeah, is, is exactly what you said. It takes eight years to build a spacecraft from proposal to design to construction to implementation to launch and then to get it to where it's going. A decade usually, and so. 
right now it is exactly what you said. We're coasting on the good investments of the past and what we have ahead of us is a precipice of space science missions, not just planetary missions, but as you said, astrophysics. GWST is the only game in town, basically. You know, we have maybe the terrestrial planet finder. That's even further uh, uh, in the future. The decisions we make now are already impacting the future. We just don't see it yet, which is what makes this very hard. So, again, we have once Cassini dies, once Opportunity finally dies, whenever that is in 100 years or so, uh, once MRO and other things die, there's nothing there to replace them. And we're going to see this basic just collapse of our planetary missions and our space science missions, unless we start doing something now, uh, which we're going to try to do in our legislative blitz. Perfect. Uh, all right. Now, now, last week uh, we've been leading up to this. So two weeks ago, actually, we had the the Rosetta people, people from the Rosetta team, to uh, help us sort of explain what was going on. Last week, we all pitched in to try and help wake Rosetta up, and apparently, it worked. So Rosetta woke up. Rosetta woke up. It was. Uh, I don't know if anyone else was watching the feed from the European Space Agency, but it was the most awkward thing, ten, kind of tension-filled thing to watch a bunch of engineers who, you know, Rosetta talking about long-term project. They selected Rosetta in 1993, so this is 21 years ago. These pe 21 years, these people have been working on this mission, and they're sitting there like this desperately hoping it's going to wake up from this deep freeze hibernation. And it came about, what, 30 minutes later than they expected, and so it was getting pretty awkward and tense there for a while. But it woke up. All the data that we're getting back from it suggests that the spaceship is healthy, the mission is moving forward, and we'll start getting amazing pictures of this comet that I won't even try to s pronounce uh, in May. Terry Gurry. Terry Gurry. Terry <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's from That's from Emily Lakdawalla. Yeah, so that's the that's the good news. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else about Rosetta, but that was just that's something we should be happy for. Did anyone here send in any video to try and help wake the spacecraft up? No? No. The, the society had a small one. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great. And so when's the next big thing going to happen with Rosetta? I think in May, and I forget the exact date, is when we'll start seeing pictures of the comet. And then in August, it's actually going to be in orbit around the comet. And then November is when they're going to harpoon and land the little Philae lander on the surface of a comet, which will be pretty spectacular. Yeah, I cannot wait. Awesome. All right, well, that's those are the big stories that I know you had. And you, if you need to book, you can you can you can head out. We. I think I'll do that. I, sorry, I can't to talk to everyone else, but thank you for uh, having me on today, everybody. Thanks for coming, Casey. Cheers. Uh, all right. Well, now I think the other big big piece of news. Oh, can then, we can we can I interject? We need to talk about comments. Q and A app is not working. Um, but we are talking it's over not. on the, it's not, uh, the event page that you started for the video, there's a comment section there, a bunch of people talking on there, that seems to be st stable um, at the moment, sort of, so leave a comment on the event page if you're watching this. Uh, I'll try and watch the YouTube comments, too. I'm seeing the QA app. There well, are nobody else is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nobody seems to be. Try it now. Me. Okay. Right now. Try it again. Yeah. So. Okay, well, you know what? I will watch the Q&A, and if questions go in there, then I will bring them up, and you sure. watch all the I'll other watch places. Watch the events, yeah. Yeah, okay, and the Twitters and whatever. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's get on with the other big piece of news, um, which is water plumes on series. Yay! Which, you know, you know what? Wouldn't it be great if they <clears> sent a spacecraft to series? Wouldn't it be <gasps> great if they sent a spacecraft to series? series. Um, so, I know some folks at the Planetary Society are saying, gosh, we should send a spacecraft to Europa. Wouldn't that be great? Because our friend, well, our not so neighborhood moon of Jupiter, Europa, is also spewing water into space from a sub ice ocean. So, but Ceres, Ceres is a lot closer. It's a dwarf planet in the outer part of the asteroid belt. And it's been also, has two water vapor plumes. And it could be, could be from cryovolcanism which is ice volcanism, or from geysers, or icy volcanoes. So it's actually pretty cool that you have another planet, that's or another body in the solar system that's pretty large, spewing water, and it's a lot closer than Jupiter. And the other thing that Ceres doesn't have, that Jupiter has, is Jupiter has a really nasty radiation environment. So if you send a spacecraft to Ceres, you don't necessarily have to design for all the radiation issues that you would out at Jupiter. So that's kind of cool. And so what was, what was this discovery made with? Was it made with... Uh, the Herschel uh, Space Telescope. So it's a European space telescope. So, And I think 
And this and, is pretty cool. So it's a team of Europeans who did this. And what does it mean? It means that um, there's some talk, actually, that Ceres is a refugee from the Kuiper Belt. So there are some models that indicate that Ceres could have originated further out in the solar system and moved inward during migration phases in the solar system, which is kind of interesting. And maybe it's sort of an overgrown comet. Um, and that this is sublimation, this is ice transforming directly into gas and taking surface dust with it. So maybe underneath there'd be fresh ice. And if you sent a spacecraft there, you could actually see fresh ice from further out in the solar system and get an idea of what early conditions were like in the solar system. So, so. we did a hangout with uh, some scientists with the Dawn mission, which is on its way to Ceres next year. Uh, it's this, We called it the Ceres series of hangouts, mm. so you should go back and look at mm. I know. Mm. Shut up. It was awesome. Oh, but they did, uh, we did talk quite a bit about the uh, possibilities of water on Ceres and the fact that they did expect to have some, but I don't think they were expecting plumes necessarily. So you can go back on the Astrosphere Vids page and see those hangouts with the scientists as well. I yeah, it's pretty cool, and also that the plumes are variable in time, that they weren't necessarily happening continuously. I, so. I wonder if there's something torquing it that we haven't, like a moon or something, because Europa and in, in Saturn's moons, those are being torqued by having Jupiter nearby, say, for, like, Europa. Yeah, that was the question that I was going to ask next, which was that, yeah, with with Europa, clearly it's the gravitational interaction with Jupiter causing these tidal flexing, and you've got this water escaping onto space with Enceladus, with with uh, with Saturn, it's the same thing. But what is what could be the force that's causing it to flex? Or as you said, is it just that it's a comet? Well, a lot of people like the idea of, oh, well, things are hitting it. Maybe there's meteorite impacts. People, people love that. So I don't know. I guess we'll find out um, next year when Siri, um, Dawn arrives at Ceres. So it's going to be could pretty this, exciting. Uh, couldn't this also be just that you know we're finding water in a lot of new places? Maybe water is just really common. You know, We just hadn't seen so much of it before, not just well, special class of objects. But what's the process that's getting that water out into space, right? Astronomers hands wave wildly as my um, undergraduate <laughs> right. planetary geology send, professor Yeah, well, let's send a spacecraft. Something hit when, it. Let's send a when, spacecraft. Oh, wait, we've already got a spacecraft going. We've got a spacecraft that'll be there in a year. When, so. when, when Don finds a moon next year, he can say, like, yep, yeah, we talked about it on Space Hangout. <laughs> Is that what it is? Do, are, is it going to be a moon? All right. I don't know. But I think it's people not... have uh, pretty exhaustively looked with Hubble for yeah. moons of Ceres. But, you know, we, always, we always find surprises when we show up at new, at, at un, un, unexplored bodies in the solar system with a spacecraft. Yeah, there are even surprises with Cassini at Saturn, things we weren't really expecting to see at all. So send spacecraft, be surprised, learn something new. So the QA app is working. I'm going to try selecting a question and see if this works. Um, so Alexander Howlett asks, is there a Saturn V LEGO kit to satisfy Amy Shearer title? Does anybody I've seen know? One. Uh, Steven, do you know there, of, of, a, of one? There was one about, uh, well, about 11 years ago now as part of a LEGO's Discovery theme. And basically they teamed up with the Discovery Channel and released a bunch of uh, space sets, including the, the Spirit and Opportunity Mars rovers, a lunar lander, a small Saturn V and a uh, lunar module, and a little uh, uh, space station model. And I collected all of them. But uh, uh, it would be dip a little difficult to find it now through uh, third parties and stuff since they, it, this was you know 11 years ago. Looks like you have Juno Although, over your shoulder. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a Lego model of Juno that I built a while back. <laughs> Although, um, awesome. how, I, how I built my um, first build of uh, Stevens Curiosity Rover is from a, a website called Rebrickable, and oftentimes they provide information for lost Lego sets. Um, as a kid, I pretty much had like every Lego Technic and space set from the late 70s through the late 80s. Um, so... It's no surprise that I'm building Curiosity. Right. How's it coming? Can you see this? Nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I basically got the chassis built. I'm getting ready to put on the uh, the front plate that the uh, arm attaches to, and then I'll be working on the uh, rocker bogey suspension. <coughs> so it's going together nicely, although the instructions are completely different than Stevens. I've built Stevens uh, Curiosity Rover uh, three times now, so this will be the fourth LEGO Curiosity I've built. And the instructions are completely different than the other three. <laughs> so, um, but I think I think we'll have it done by the end of the hangout. All right. Well, since this is your your fourth time, this has got to be going fast for you. 
I, but I this have is, confidence. But, but this is different than the other three, but I'll, I'll make it. I'll make it. Um, so, Sonny, one last question about series. Do you plan to zap it as, as your way? So, main belt, it's really far away. So we, I think we've done Ceres and Vesta once. Actually, we have, uh, we do some main belts that are closer, but Ceres is super far away, and we just, we just don't do big main belts here. It just but, is not but done. Some also, the, the telescope's best. broken. Right, right. Did you want to mention that? Did you want to quickly? <laughs> All right, yeah, so there was a magnet. Because I actually mag- sent you. I wasn't I, here. The, did, remember, I sent you a video of the new uh, Battlefield 4 game, and in that game, one of the scenes is in the Arecibo Observatory, and one of the things you can do is destroy the observatory, and it just, I couldn't even bring myself we to do it. We should get royalties. Um, so there was a magnitude 6.4 earthquake on Monday last week, which was a holiday here, and we had a bunch of students as part of the Alfalfa Consortium here learning about how to analyze pulsar data and not sleep, and on Monday there was an earthquake, and sort of some people saw, okay, some of the tension was affected in the tie downs, whatever, and kept observing, and then Tuesday, because the observatory was closed on Monday, Tuesday, people went up to the hill to go look at the tie downs and said, oh God, or not the tie downs, the cables, and said, this one's been damaged. That cable has actually been through a rough time. Uh, when it was built in the upgrade in the 80s, I think, it was built, it was made one meter too short, so they had to put these extenders on it. The back of it is encased in zinc, and so there's some pretty visible damage. They're going to get a fix going in about. Um, I don't know, maybe six weeks, it would be millions of dollars to replace it and rig it up. So the telescope isn't running right now, which is super sad because there's all sorts of exciting asteroids coming by, and we're hoping that the next couple of months it'll be back in business. But this also means when friends visit me, we can't go up to the telescope platform, and we can't even go under the dish like they did in those video game scenes Fraser sent me. Yeah, yeah. We, I, what do you do? You, you got to plant some C4, drop those big towers, and then you drive your Jeep down <laughs> below the dish... It's awesome. I mean, it would. Yeah, a, if I should uh, contact the game writers and say, "Hey, you should, you know, contribute to a Save Arecibo Observatory Fund." That's a good, that's a good idea. Um, all right. Well, the other big piece of news, of course, is the new supernova discovery in M82. So, Nicole, what's the lowdown on this? I'm so excited. Uh, yeah. So I uh, couldn't sleep as usual. And <laughs> found myself on Twitter at 5.30 in the morning, and people are talking about a new supernova that's gone off in M82. This is so exciting. So M82 is a galaxy. It's actually the nearest starburst galaxy to us, and it's, uh, right, next, it's, it's right around the corner. It's only 12 million light years away, uh, so that, that's close for us. Uh, and a supernova went off. It, is a ty- it has been uh, determined to be a type 1a supernova that makes it a white dwarf supernova. Uh, it is the closest of those, one of those to have happened since, I want to say that, uh, I've heard the dates thrown around for other nearby ones, but the latest I heard was the 70s, and so we've got much better telescopes now, so we can watch this one, track this one, as it gets brighter, it hasn't even reached peak brightness yet, uh, learn something about how Type 1A supernova evolve, uh, and both uh, and, and learn something hopefully about the progenitor mechanism, that means what causes it, is it a white dwarf and a red giant star where the red giant's dumping material onto the white dwarf and it gets too close to the Chandra so car limit and <laughs> explodes. Or is it uh, two white dwarfs spiraling in on each other that then uh, collide and form the supernovas? We're still not sure which of those two models is the most accurate. And so it's nearby. Uh, everyone with the telescope is, is looking at it. And uh, I know we had uh, we had an almost discovery in the virtual star party last night. I know, I've got the video queued up, so we'll, we'll go to that in a, in a, in okay. a second. Okay, all right, I'll yeah. let you guys cover that, because I wasn't around yeah. for that. But yeah. uh, it's really exciting. They're also uh, going to uh, hopefully doing some follow-up with uh, radio telescopes to see uh, the radio afterglow as well. I think that's kind of a an intriguing prospect. And so nearby supernova, these are the standard candles we use to do cosmology. It was involved in the discovery of dark energy in 1998. So it's so cool to have one happen so close by. Um, although I, I admit a lot of us were on Twitter going, really, Type 1A in M82? It's got a lot of it's got a lot of star formation, a lot of recent star formation, so you expect there to be big stars and big core collapse supernova. Um, but no, this was a, this appears to be a white dwarf supernova. So check it out. I am definitely going to try and go for it with the 8-inch telescope at our university over the next couple of weeks and see if I can show it at the star party. We'll, uh, we saw it at a star us. party two nights ago. Yeah, I did. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, from downtown Tampa, as a matter of fact, which uh, is pretty light-related. So. Yeah, yeah. 
So do you guys want to chime in on the virtual star parties? <laughs> I, I, I can point out the discovery I, was was just um, made by a bunch of undergrad students who were doing imaging M82 yeah. for a school project, and uh, they noticed that there was a bright star that shouldn't be there, and uh, it, made the announcement. It was ironic because I rewatched that virtual star party afterwards, and we were talking about the possibility of a supernova in M82 while we were imaging. Really? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let yeah. me let me let me play this, and yeah. you can and you can see just how close we were. This is unbelievable. All right. Here we go. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and play my sound so you can actually hear us talking. I, I'm not sure it's gonna work, but we'll see. Um, so just to set this up, uh, John Kramer had had posted an image of M82, and we were talking about how, it, because it's a star-forming galaxy, there are supernovae in it. So here, check this out. So here, here we are. Here's M82. Um, and, uh, all right. Okay. Um, Can you, does the sound coming through? Here. Yep. Yeah. This is Messier 82. M82, which right is a galaxy. right there. Also commonly called the Cigar Galaxy in Ursa Major. Yeah. Oh, and you can see uh, the dust, different distribution. <laughs> you get a cursor on it. <laughs> well, the the now cursor, not the then cursor. One of the classic pictures. There's one that's taken by Hubble. It's right there. Uh, it shows oh. nobody oh, called it. Cursor. It shows the cigar-shaped galaxy, but then also this crazy sort of uh, filament structure that's coming off from the center of the galaxy as well. Something happened. In this galaxy. Yeah, that's an act, what's called an active galaxy. Here comes. I remember my, my astronomy lessons. Uh, it's uh, it's got it has a, a huge a lot of a lot of dust in it. Also has a very active star forming region in it. In it. Um, and I don't think it's a producer of supernovae. <laughs> <laughs> Step for this week. It does put a lot Oops. of research. It's, it's really prominent in, in the radio frequencies as opposed to optical. Yeah. So. I, wah, wah, I, wah. I, I, I kicked myself, Fraser, because I, I was reconfiguring my telescope and I totally wasn't watching while you guys had that image up there. I might have might have seen it. <laughs> so Fraser, uh, a supernova goes off in front of your face. What does it take to get your guys' attention? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, oh, and oh, you missed it. Oh, and, and then, and then Tom said, "Oh, I wish we had Nicole Gallucci here to explain that better." Ah! So, so, okay, so just, so just so people are clear, right? Because I think this is this is kind of important, right? Is yeah, because I would have been on Wikipedia at the same time looking the up super, info, and the, I may have to, I, I may have been like, "Wait, that looks silly." Wait, wait. The supernova was was announced on Tuesday morning. Yeah, they yeah. they made the discovery on the twenty first. So we saw it on the nineteenth. <laughs> yeah. It was all over the net Wednesday morning, so. Yeah. So if one yeah. of us in, if anyone, anyone had said, hey, that star doesn't belong there. Any of us had said, that's that kind of looks like a supernova there. Every and that's what the students at I, I forgot what university. Uh, yeah. That's what the students at that particular university did, and they, uh, you know, and and I'm happy for that. I'm happy for them. I'm yeah. sad for you guys, but I'm happy that a group of undergrads just oh, no. getting started. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, how are they going to, you know, one of them's like, how am I going to top that? Like, <laughs> I discovered a yeah. supernova as an undergrad. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so Tom, Tom Nathy. Yeah, Tom, Tom Nathy says, face palm, I'm so embarrassed. Tom, this was, this was yours to lose, I got to say. <laughs> it just, it was right there in front of you. You were talking about supernova. If I had asked you, like, what does a supernova look like in the galaxy, oh, we would have seen it anyway. All, all you need to do is compare it against uh, somebody else's image somewhere on the web, and that would have that would have done it. That would have done it. People, I think. How many people would be watching this right now if you could say, "Hey, come on in, we might discover a supernova." <laughs> yeah. Well, we, no, we say that every week. We're, we're, gonna catch, works. we're gonna catch an impact on Jupiter during one of the shows, so we'll make yeah, up. yeah, yeah that'll, that'll be the next. That's that's right, because we're catching all the live stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, so anyway, it's super exciting. I I can't wait to sort of see. It's gonna be growing in brightness, David. Right? We're gonna see it's gonna. Yeah, be... it's a, the last time I saw on AAVSO uh, was about ten point five magnitude, ten point five. That's pretty. It's not quite binocular brightness, but it's close. It's small telescope. You can pick it up. We picked it up. It was a 12-inch Dobsonian we were using Wednesday night, and we saw it. Great. Um, I'm excited. Okay, well, it's good. Yeah. I was yeah. too young to, for 1987A, and that was in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is like, I'm excited about this one. Yeah. Yeah. We've we The universe owes us a bright nearby supernova. So 
like it owes us a comment. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know what? I want to move on now and talk with Elizabeth, who just returned from Mars. And, and last time I think we had you, we were sending you off to Mars. Yes, exactly. It was a long trip. You know, it took many, many planes, many pieces of luggage. It was a terrible trip. No, no. Uh, I went to uh, Utah's Mars Desert Research Station, and I was there with a group of people led by the University of North Dakota, actually, and we were trying to do a science, basically, out there. And what made it interesting is that we were trying to make it as close to Mars exploration as we could. And so one of the things we did, actually, was every time we went outside, we put on a spacesuit, like literally. We'd have uh, a jumpsuit on, and then we would put on a little bubble helmet, and we'd have a backpack on our backs and have these boots on and gaiters to kind of keep the mud out. And then we'd go striding out into the desert. And it's weird. Like, I don't know if you have the pictures there, Fraser, but it makes the landscape look completely different if you put somebody there in a mock spacesuit in front of it. And... It was a challenge to work in these things. They weren't fully pressurized. You know, we could still move our hands and move our legs and all of that, but it still got hot in those things, and they were heavy. And when you're walking up a hill, you're not too sure where your center of gravity is going to be. If you're going to go tumbling bit down, that'd be a really bad day. So you're trying not to do that. And then you're trying to do work. You know, you're trying to put up radio telescopes or to do communication studies or check out the geology of the area. It's a really challenging, but also really a lot of fun. Yeah, you you sent in a video of of what you were doing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show that it's pretty long, and there's lots of cool parts to it. But I'm gonna show the uh, the part of you guys heading outside here. Let's see. Um, hold on. You guys didn't get caught up in the polar vortex, did you, Elizabeth, out there? Actually, we had some travel problems on the way in because remember that big snowstorm that hit the east coast around January second. Yeah. Almost everybody got caught in that. Um, I luckily went right over it into Vegas, and so I didn't have to stop at. That. Washington or Boston or anywhere else that was being destroyed by the snow, but a bunch of our crew members were delayed by hours, and for a while we didn't even know if we'd get there on time, because one guy even got his luggage kind of confiscated in the whole fiasco, so it was it was a long flight for them. So working. See. You can't hear the music. Hold on, let me see if I can play the music here, because it's just. I don't know. Is it a uh, is it a B movie? Yeah, I gotta say, it looks like an old Planet of the Apes. Movie yeah, is this you know? <laughs> That's great. I'm waiting for uh, Sean Connery to show up in a speedo with a plastic <laughs> gun. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this is great. I mean, I mentioned this last time when you were heading off that. Um, stop you. Uh, that. Uh, that this is the way we're going to explore space, right? Is that we're going to send people to figure out what it takes to actually hammer rocks into the ground, and what does it take to set up antenna, and what does it take to to prepare a healthy, nutritious meal, and where are you going to go to the bathroom, and all that kind of stuff. I've, so, I've built a radio telescope in a park in the snow. Does that count? Yeah, that's <laughs> halfway to Mars. <laughs> well, it's totally it's because it's... It's such a challenge to figure out all the little individual things. I mean, it even came down to, for me, trying to figure out how to cook for six people using dehydrated food. I wasn't doing a very good job, and my crew members were letting me know after about a week. They said, you know, Elizabeth, it's okay. We can take care of our breakfast and lunches. Just have you spend all your brain power trying to think about dinner. That's basically how they were doing it. And uh, But it's just all these little things. You know, how do you uh, sleep? while you're out there. You know, how do you shower, especially when we had a water shortage for four days? We had to figure out substitutes for that kind of thing. Um, how do you hammer in a radio telescope and you're wearing this he heavy uh, spacesuit backpack and trying to do that at the same time? And all these little procedures, all these little mental things, physiological things, physical things are going to be hopefully coalesced into a database somewhere and then given to whoever makes it up to the red planet first because we need all the data we can get to figure this stuff out. Would you sit down and talk with any of the people who want to go on the on the 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 one-way mission to Mars and try to talk them out of it? You talk them <laughs> into it? I don't know if it's really a talk in, talk out. It's sort of your personality, whether you want to be more of a colonizer, somebody who goes over and wants to, uh, to stay there, or if you're more of a person who just wants to explore and then come back and tell their friends good stories over beer at the end of the day. So I think it's more of a function of your personality, whether you want to go there or back. But anyway, I'd be happy to talk to them. What if you're the kind of person who wants to suffocate on the surface of an alien know? planet? Pardon me? What if you're the kind of person who wants to suffocate on the surface of an alien planet? <laughs> well, then I don't have anything to say to you there. All right. You're trying to stay alive. <laughs> you're really okay. trying to stay alive. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. No, that's great. I'm, and we're I'm really glad you got a chance to do that. And 
I, you know, I'm sure we'll see it in your writing. Um, yeah, and, and in all seriousness, if anybody else is interested in doing this, it's run by the Mars Society, and every year they have a call for volunteers to go out to these places. So you need to put in your uh, your application. There's one in Canada on Devon Island, and there's also another one in Utah, although I think the Devon Island one might be a bit occupied with their one-year mission, but you never know. Anyway, just go to their website, check it out in a few months uh, around the summertime. You should see some application details for the Mars Society, Mars Desert Research Station. Fantastic. All right. Um, man, still so many stories. The, this is absolutely going to run long, and I apologize in advance, but uh, it's going to run long. Um, and if anyone needs to go, you absolutely can. Um, all right. Uh, so let's talk to Morgan uh, Renberg about uh, NASA's quantum computer. Morgan. Yeah, so you might remember last year, NASA teamed up with Google and a group of universities to buy one of the first commercially available uh, quantum computers. And they set it up at Ames Research, and they've been testing it basically nonstop since last summer through till now. And they just came out with sort of a glimpse at how it's performed for them so far. And for the things that it's really good at, it's just as good as the best computers we have today. And that's impressive considering how young the quantum computing field is. But there's, there's also a lot of caveats there. You know, there's a reason that we don't all have quantum computers sitting on our desks. Uh, for practical purposes, you have to cool these things down to just a hair over absolute zero. Yeah, so they're also about the size of a room, so you need a pretty big desk. Uh, but we're talking about cooling these things down to millikelvin, so way colder than space. Um, and these aren't general purpose computers, which means that you can't, you know, install Windows on one and then, you know, open Google Chrome and have a Hangout. Uh, they only solve a few problems. And what they're good at is optimizing things. And it's pretty easy to think about why, you know, Google might want to optimize things. Every time you do a Google search, you're asking them to take your input information, compare it to the Internet, and optimize the best answer for you to have. Uh, but it's a little bit harder to see maybe why NASA uh, would want that until you sort of look ahead. Uh, and we were talking earlier about James Webb, and we have uh, LSST being started now down in Chile. And astronomy is sort of poised here to generate sort of unknowable amounts of data. And we need a way to sift through that. And it turns out that at least in theory, quantum computers are really good at going through and sifting for say, finding all the spiral galaxies, or looking for supernova. Uh, they can do these things much more efficiently, in theory, than actual classical, normal, you know, silicon computers can. Uh, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I, uh, I had a chance to, to see a presentation from NASA and Google about the D-Wave uh, computer that they were using, and the, the gist of the whole presentation was we're pretty sure it's a quantum computer, but we're not entirely sure. Yeah, this sort of hinges on, on part of the problems that they're having, which is quantum computers are made up of these things called qubits or quantum bits. Uh, and basically you're taking tiny little, you know, very tiny, fundamentally sized particles and linking them together so that you can manipulate them as ones and zeros like we do in a normal computer. But this is really, really tough to do. And, you know, this sort of state-of-the-art quantum computer has only 512 of these. And they're really noisy, which means, you know, you, quantum mechanics is based on probability. So you don't always get the same answer. And, in fact, with a computer like this, you very often don't get the same answer. And so you don't know, you know, is this uh, a quantum computer or is this sort of, you know, the algorithms that we have to use to program it bleeding through and giving us the answer. And we're not there yet in terms of, sort of answering that question, but as we continue to test them, we're going to get a better sense of uh, whether it's working and how well it works. Yeah, I think it's just so hilarious that they, they've got to the point with this device that they're fairly sure that it's just doing the thing. Like, I, I can't even, you know, you bought a dishwasher and you, you, know, you weren't entirely sure it was washing your dishes with water in there. Could be gnomes, maybe water, you're not sure. So, so that's that was the gist of the, of the presentation that I saw, and there, you know, and people are still arguing, people are still questioning whether or not it is actually truly a quantum computer. So, uh, that that is uh, that's exciting, um, and also a harbinger of our future robot apocalypse. Um, so let's move on. Uh, Dave Dickinson, yes, tell us the things we're going to be able to see in space soon. 
Oh, this uh, this weekend we've got one of the first occultations of Saturn by the moon. I wrote about that on Universe Today this week. Most of the world will see a near miss, uh, but it will be kind of cool to see them paired very, very close within uh, a degree, and the moon's only half a degree in apparent size. So uh, tomorrow morning, if you get up and look and see, the moon just passed first quarter yesterday, so it's going to be waning crescent. It's going to be very, very close to the planet Saturn. If you happen to live down in South America, you'll actually see, like in Argentina and Chile, they're actually going to see the moon occult Saturn for the first time uh, for this year. It's going to actually occult it 11 times, and we're going to have one that's going to be a daytime occultation here in North America in August. Probably is going to be the best one we're going to see here. Saturn is uh, it's a tough one to see. Uh, with the telescope, you'll be able to see it in the daytime on the limb of the moon, though it's not the easiest. All the planets get occulted by the moon except Neptune and Jupiter, in 2014, so it's going to be an interesting year as far as uh, watching the path of the moon and seeing where the moon is going. And the moon is approaching new here at the end of this week, and then it's going to be coming back around again. So we actually have two new moons this month. That's kind of unusual as well. We had one uh, January 1st, and we have one January 30th. So and next month we have no new moons. So that's kind of unusual too. And then April we've got a. Um... A lunar eclipse. eclipse. Yes, we have two lunar eclipses this year, and North America gets to see them both. So, although there are no total solar eclipses this year, we kind of make up for it with uh, two lunar eclipses, and there are two partial. There's one uh, annular solar eclipse and one partial solar eclipse that North America will see in October. There's only four eclipses total this year: two lunar and two solar, and that is the minimum number you can have in one year. So. Yeah. Now, last week, we introduced, it's so funny, we introduced this uh, video from Mike Phillips, who joins on the Virtual Star Party. He yes. did this great image of uh, Jupiter and its, and its moons moving back and forth. And, and I, you know, he talked to me, and he sort of let me know that he'd, he'd done this. And I was like, that's, that's fantastic, but I want to see, because it was just kind of going back and forth. And I said, yeah. I want to see the whole thing. I want to see the whole thing rotate <laughs> all the way around, please. And uh, and he said, yeah, I think I could probably, you know, I think that data is there. Um, yeah. And so he stitched together. I don't know what he did this on my behest, but uh, but he stitched together a full um, rotation of Jupiter. So I just want to show this. Uh, to yeah, you, it's, it's pretty it's... amazing. Yeah, Jupiter. I, I thought at first he shot that all in one night, but he, I asked him, and he shot that in a series of five nights. And and he said he was lucky that he had clear weather for five nights because the the cloud patterns on Jupiter change. So in order to stitch that all together in the program he was using, if he couldn't have really waited too long, otherwise it would have been too radically different uh, to, yeah. to get it all stitched together. But okay. you can see Jupiter rotates once every 9.9 .9 hours, so you can kind of see a, a rotation all in one night. So look at this. Again, music. I know it's very silent here. In yeah, it's, uh, you know, and I compared that for fun. I was looking through other spacecraft animation, and we actually found uh, a rotation animation from New Horizons, and his stacks up pretty well against it. Ah, move. Okay. There. Just stop. Let's just start again. I think it's also in high, ultra high HD. I noticed. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that just terrific? Like, have you ever seen anything like this done by an amateur astronomer? Go, Mike! Just amazing. Yeah. All right. It's amazing how we can stitch all those together too, and it's pretty, pretty seamless. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. like I said, I. I, I've seen NASA rotations from other spacecraft that you can see on YouTube, right. like New Horizons, that aren't as detailed as that. New Horizons was the last one to fly by Jupiter in 2006, I believe it was. No, it took off in 2006. I think it was 2008 New Horizons went by Jupiter. Um, and then the, the, I think the last thing we're going to have time for, well, we got, maybe we've got a little more time. I've been moving things along pretty quickly, which is Mike, Mike Simmons, we haven't heard from yet. And uh, you were going to bring some stories about uh, John Dobson. Or oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we talked about John Dobson before, and I've sort of been struck by the fact that most people seem to uh, uh, have a more current take on John Dobson. All the pictures that seem to be out there, he's like in his 80s, which is, you know, it's not that recent even for him. But 
he's been around since the 70s, and, and everybody talks about him as the inventor of the Dobsonian mount, uh, which is funny. First of all, he told me he's the last person they should name something after because he objects to calling things Newtonian or Cassegrain. He doesn't think designs should be named after a person, and he got one named after him. But what he did was he started making them for the first time, and he... He was a character. He was out in the 70s. Uh, they didn't let him in some of the national parks to do his thing because he just he wore nothing but a loincloth because it was hot and that's what he felt comfortable in. And so he and his band of uh, merry band of hippies traveling around in a 60s style bus uh, were, were, were a, a little out of the ordinary and they weren't always always welcome in these public places, but. He's the first one that really took uh, astronomy to the people on the streets. We used to do uh, star parties out in dark sky places, you know, where we were used to going with our equatorial telescopes, and nobody did anything like what he did. And it's just like, you know, what were we thinking? We'd have a star party 100 miles away, and nobody would come. So he, he just really changed everything. That's his big contribution. He got people to get out on the street. Like, you've seen, everybody's seen him in the videos. Hey, come see the moon. Come look at the sun. And, he would stand there. He was a real circus barker. So he's a real character, but he really started the movement. It seems so natural now, but nobody nobody did that. It was really everybody out in the dark someplace with equatorial telescopes that they had to build themselves most of the time. So he, he really ha has a, you know, we I don't know if we would have anything like we have in terms of outreach now. He He's really the father of everything that's going on now. I think we've got some good outreach happening this time around, but uh, I think, oh, yeah. um, you know, you've all, I mean, a bunch of the people here have, have done a lot of the sidewalk astronomy, right? Like, Ray, you've been out with your telescope. I know, uh, I know, David, you've been out with your telescope. Nicole's been out with the telescope, and, you know, I mean, that's, there is, that is the greatest experience when you're out there on the sidewalk, on the corner, with your telescope, and who knows who's going to come by. In many cases, these people have never looked through a telescope in their whole lives and suddenly they can't believe their eyes. They're looking at Saturn. They're looking at Jupiter, the moons of Jupiter, They're looking at the craters on the moon and it blows their mind. And it is this it is this connection that you can give people from from the uh, just the day to day experience that they normally have to this connection to the cosmos. And it is it is one of the greatest gifts I think you can give people. And so that's why I just think what he what he pushed forward with sidewalk astronomy was you know has will resonate on for hundreds of years. Oh, millions of people have uh, seen things as as a result of him. Imagine if we had all these people uh, doing astronomy and nobody was doing it on the sidewalks. Everybody is out by themselves or the rest of their 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 friends. And uh, you know all the telescopes were the big fancy computerized ones. We didn't have commercial companies then really much at all. So. Um, it's just one of those things. It's hard to imagine a, a world without what we're doing. It's. I work with countries everywhere in the world, more than a hundred, and is the most common thing that amateur astronomers do by far, everywhere. Um, so what did we miss, uh, Elizabeth? I know you were going to mention. Uh, what? Which one do you want? I give you. I give you a choice. Which one do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about your spacewalks, or do you want to talk about uh, NASA probes for climate change? Uh, let's go over the spacewalks. And so uh, there's an interesting bit out of that leak investigation that's been going on, seems like forever, but uh, just to bring people up to speed again, what happened was there was a leak over the summer and a helmet during a spacewalk. Very bad thing, obviously, so NASA was pulling everybody off spacewalks while they tried to figure out what to do. As we all remember, however, there was an ammonia leak on the space station in December, and so NASA brought out these snorkel things and also these pads, and they said, okay, we're good to go. We're going to let the astronauts go outside, do the fix, and there absolutely was no problem with the spacesuit. However, they still don't know exactly how that leak happened. They have traced it down to a uh, basically a fan pump separator inside of the backpack, but they just don't know what exactly caused it. And because of that, they're not really sure if they're going to go forward with any sort of routine spacewalks in the near future. And so it was interesting because I was talking to the Expedition 40 crew, Expedition 3940 crew, which is going to be launching in March, and they have a couple of spacewalks on the books. They're going to be essentially doing some cleanup tasks on the station, but they don't know if they're going to do it yet. They're just sitting there waiting and saying, well, maybe we'll go, maybe we don't. It just really depends on uh, what NASA finds with those spacesuits in the near future. Um, I like so I like the fact they've got like they've got like what like a snorkel they can breathe through inside the yeah. helmet. 
you know, what they essentially did was they took a pipe and they repurposed it, and then they have it there as an emergency spot because then you can breathe from a spot down here, sort of at your chest, instead of out of the helmet where the leak might be happening. So uh, it's an emergency backup procedure, and surely you don't want that to be happening, but if you really needed to, at least you got a backup. Hmm. Ray Sanders, how's it coming? <gasps> Look at that. Wow! Is that done? You can't we hear can't you. hear you. Aww. He's, he's muted. muted. Yeah, he's muted. Yeah. I'm Ray Sanders, and I built a Lego rover. It's oh, pretty great. I do more than that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for the caption. You know, what I was saying is, just as uh, you were talking about the spacesuits, I was thinking of Apollo 13 with the uh, plastic bags and duct tape and um, all sorts of inventiveness, and here we are having NASA inventiveness. Slow down. <laughs> slow down. You're, you're uh, like a bumblebee learned? moving around. Pick it up. Higher. <laughs> higher. There we go. Yeah. And slowly turn it. Nice. I'm used yeah, to my other slow. camera. This this camera on my laptop is not as uh, good about capturing fast motion. That's fantastic. All right. And, uh, and Stephen, do you have your version? Let's see. We'll hold them both up, and we'll go back and forth and make sure we can compare. Oh, uh, the original version? Yeah, hold on for a second, Fraser. I've got his in case he doesn't have it. Oh, you got one. more. So you're going to hold up like a bunch of them here. Oh, my gosh. Look at this. Rovers. I have so robot many rovers. Rover it's Rover Mania. I love it. Oh, wow. that's terrific. Yeah, the one I'm holding is the original prototype that I submitted to the Kusa website. Cool. Well, Can you just go to a store and buy it for curiosity? Uh, yes. Apparently, gonna, it's not available in stores, only I online. I posted a link. Yeah, I posted a link on the comments of the event page. So if you want to go check that out. That's awesome. And actually, here is... This one is spare parts. This one is all my all my spare parts, and oh my God. it is it is ugly, but uh, it's adorable. So we we, we kind of keep it in the engineering room, away from all the other ones. But uh, yeah, so now I'm the proud owner of uh, what three and a half Mars rovers, and uh, so yeah, if, I need if to you can't sure find evidence. Letter. Yeah, if you can't find evidence of uh, the proper conditions for life in the ancient past, then I don't know what to do. Like, you've well, got all, everything sure, you need. I need to make sure I don't get them wet or feed them after midnight, otherwise I'm going to be really <laughs> in trouble. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, why don't we wrap this up then? I think we've sort of reached our hour. I'm sorry to be moving so quickly through all the stories because there just was so much this week. Um, so I'm going to give everyone a chance to kind of where we can find out more and learn more and, and so on. So I'm going to start alphabetically by first name with Sondi, which I know is very strange, <laughs> but that's not her real name. So You can find me at Sondi, S-O-N-D-Y, on Twitter. Um, and I've been terrible about updating my own blog. So yeah, just find me on Twitter with lots of snark and vim uh, and uh, at complaints about the telescope not working. Mm. Well, keep keep us up to date because because that is a really important observatory. So, all right, Dave Dickinson, where do we find out more? Let's see, I am Astro Guys with the Z. I was active this week on my own site, on Universe Today, on Listosaur.com, and I will be doing public viewing at Starkey Park tomorrow night with Pasco County astronomers. Free to all. If you're in the Tampa Bay area, come on out. So looks like it's going to be clear tomorrow night, and I'll be doing the virtual star party Sunday night. Yeah, awesome. Two right, star Elizabeth. parties this weekend. So, so many star parties. Elizabeth, where do we find out more? Uh, you can go to my uh, Twitter feed, which is Howell Space, H-O-W-E-L-L -L Space. And uh, I've been active this week on all sorts of places, actually, because of the Mars mission. So if you go to my website, which is elizabethhowell.ca, and you go into media appearances there, you can see some of the places where I've been on in the past week. In addition, of course, the usual reporting for Universe Today, Space, uh, and a few other places. Astronomers Without Borders, obviously. <coughs> Mike Simmons, where do we find out more? Uh, astronomerswithoutborders.org, and uh, we'll have Global Astronomy Month coming up soon, too, and you'll hear more about that. And if you find something on the website you want to comment on, you can talk to our communications manager, Elizabeth Howell, uh, and, and, or our webmaster, Ray Sanders' wife, Liz. Uh, so it looks like we're going to be assimilated. We are. We're going to take over. Yeah, this is one of the things that people don't realize is that they, when you come into this family, you get yeah. uh, you get, you get uh, assimilated into a lot. You get of assimilated, yeah. You get. My grandfather get... used to say, "The family that sticks together is stuck." 
so of course the uh, the the seventies child in me has got "We Are Family" running through my head now. That's disco song is going to be stuck all day long. Thanks to <laughs> Thanks for the earworm, Ray. Thanks for sharing hey, that. I had to share it. I'm not going to be stuck with it by myself. See, we are family. We've been right. like siblings. Morgan, where do we find out more? Yeah, the website's cosmicchatter.org. Cosmic underscore chatter on Twitter. And and as the new guy starting to feel how you know you get to put to work in many different yeah, ways. Yeah, I'm ready You're to also be sucked in. CosmoQuest, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep, we'll be doing the uh, monthly news roundup in about a week, so probably before next episode. Excellent. Resistance is futile. Nicole Gallucci, who is already deeply assimilated into the Borg structure. I am, yes. So I'm over at CosmoQuest.org, where I, uh, this week, blogged about the Supernova and M82 and a really cool lunar panorama from Chang Yi. So check that out on CosmoQuest.org. Also like to do a brief announcement, since Matthew Francis couldn't make it, he's in charge of Cosmo Academy, uh, which is uh, our online classes. So we've got a new schedule up. Uh, Ray is one of our instructors. I don't know if you've got a new one coming up. Uh, and I will be teaching in probably the summer. You'll probably do a summer class. I'm doing yeah. an astrobiology class. Matthew's teaching about dark matter. So go to cosmoacademy.org to look for those uh, those new classes. I'm also blogging again for Discovery and on noise as noisy astronomer. So all over the place. Ray Sanders, where do we find out more? Um, I blog dearastronomer.com, Twitter dear astronomer, or as Nicole was just saying. Um, the uh, CosmoQuest.org, uh, or uh, actually more specifically, Cosmo Academy, uh, where hopefully this summer I'll have uh, either a new course or be teaching one of my other, um, like Astro 101, Astro 102 courses. So Fantastic. Thank you. All right, and Stephen, this is your chance. We'll shamelessly self-promote the stuff that you're working on. Uh, yeah, I guess the best place to go would be the, the Kuso website at uh, lego.kuso.com. There's a link there to my project page, and on that page are links to my, my Flickr stuff, so you can see all sorts of uh, all my other space models, like uh, Cygnus and Voyager and Juno, and, uh, and uh, there's also uh, links to, you know, digital models of, uh, for a, a Lego model of the Sky Crane that you could build to go with your Curiosity Kit if you want. So there's just a lot of uh, interesting stuff there. But, but Steven, you're still keeping your day job, right? I mean, you didn't, you didn't quit building uh, Mars rovers to build models of Mars rovers. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm still a, a mechanical engineer designing a spacecraft. Good. Uh, I, yeah. Right. Um, okay, cool. And of course, I am a uh, publisher of Universe Today. And now, one quick announcement is that uh, we are in the process of creating a whole bunch of actual uh, podcast feeds for all of the video and audio that we're doing. So I know that the audio of this show goes out on the Astro 365, but there's no place that you can get the video, nor there's no place to get the audio or the video of the Virtual Star Party or the, the explainers, the guide to space that we on YouTube, so now you can. So if you actually go to you to YouTube, and you do a search for, um, sorry, not YouTube. So if you go to iTunes and you do a search for Universe Today, you can see all of the Guide to Space videos that we're doing there. You can actually just download them, and they show up on your on your portable player just the way a podcast would. So, and we're going to try and sort of do that with Astronomy Cast, the, the Astronomy Cast videos as well. Those are going to start showing up on the in the Astronomy Cast feed. And so we've got plans to try and make all this stuff available. And well, we and have we're putting... been also on the YouTube channel, Astrosphere Vids has been posting all the Hangouts. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, so there's lots of this stuff on YouTube, but mm -hmm. people can't, like, what well, people are yeah, watching it right that. now, but there's a ton of people that just want this to show up on their device, and, and that, they want to have it, like, like any podcast. And so okay. the plan is, these will all start being podcasts as well. So um, I know a lot of people have been asking for that, so we this out with, with the stuff we've been doing with Universe Today, the short videos, and then we're going to try and do some of the longer stuff. So, so that'll be coming soon. Um, cool. Well, hey, thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks for the great crew. This is fantastic, and all. And thanks to the universe for providing so many awesome stories this week. It's uh, it was a real <laughs> treat. <laughs> and and, this, and it was a real special treat to see the Curiosity rover come together in Lego. That was uh, thanks Ray for for putting this together, and Stephen, thanks for building it. We really appreciate it. All right. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. <laughs>